you're probably looking at me and saying, hey, that's not Jay. Well, I wasn't supposed to be up here this morning. Um, Jay was supposed to continue his series on evil and suffering, but Jay's sick this morning. And so here I am, and um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've missed standing up here on Sunday mornings, so it, it's good to be here. It's good to open up God's Word. And so, if you have a copy of God's Word, if you will turn with me to the second to the last book of the Bible, the book of Jude, the book of Jude this morning. Jude is uh, one of those books that I, I think can often be overlooked. It's in the shadow of Revelation. It's tucked after John's three letters. But Jude is such a powerful book, and it has so much to say to us today. Uh, and so I, I pray that you will be challenged and encouraged this morning through God's Word. We're going to be looking at the entire book of Jude this morning. Um, if you often worry about me going long, like in Sunday school, uh, you can start praying now. Uh, we're going to be looking at the entire book of Jude. And so if you will, stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God as we read the entirety of the book of Jude. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also... Relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feast as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever." It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires, they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, 
building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. May it be a light to our feet, a light to our path. Help us to be warned. Help us to be encouraged. May we be strengthened so that we might not sin against you. And Father, I pray that today that your spirit might do a powerful work of salvation amongst us. I pray for those here who don't know Christ. I pray that even now your spirit will give them new birth. And Father, for the saints here, I pray they might be built up that they might contend for the faith. I pray that we, your church, will walk in humble obedience, all for your glory, all for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. By the grace of God, I was able to baptize my daughter today what an immense blessing. It is also, providentially, Reformation Sunday. Now, this is the Sunday before Reformation Day, which is on the 31st. While most people will be trick-or-treating for Halloween, we want to remember to celebrate Reformation Day. And I think witnessing a baptism on Reformation Sunday ought to give us pause and cause us to reflect on that which is most central to our faith. Abigail was baptized as an outward visual testimony to an inner reality, namely that she is publicly confessing faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. She is testifying that she has died with Christ and that she is also partaking in his resurrection. All of this rich, full theology is what's packed into a phrase like, she's been born again. Or maybe even, she's been saved, redeemed, rescued from the kingdom of darkness and delivered into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And this is a salvation that scripture teaches is by grace alone, not by works. It's a salvation that's through faith alone. And it is a faith that rests in Christ alone. All to the glory of God alone. This is what we celebrate for Reformation Day. This is what we're remembering on Reformation Sunday. But the theology of the 16th century was much different. The Roman Catholic Church was teaching that salvation was not by grace alone, but it was also through works of penance. There were even those who believed that salvation could be purchased through indulgences. These little pieces of paper that you would pay for that could be redeemed, as it were, to get a soul out of purgatory. What they were teaching is that Christ and the apostles and the saints, that, that they had been so righteous while alive on earth that some of this extra righteousness had been stored away in the treasuries of heaven and, and they could be made available to any sinner for a price. On October 31st, 1517, however, a German monk by the name of Martin Luther 
challenge these blasphemous doctrines by nailing 95 theses or, or 95 statements to the castle door in Wittenberg, Germany, and arguing that the scriptures taught that salvation was found not in works of penance, not in a pope or a council, not in indulgences, but salvation was found only in the person and work of Christ Jesus alone. And thus the Protestant Reformation was sparked 502 years ago. And for that, we who are Protestants, and we especially who would call ourselves Reformed, ought to celebrate the Reformation and how God used the Scriptures and a monk and a mallet and a door to recapture the power of the Gospel all over the world. And the echoes of that mallet on that door reverberate even down to today. But even as we celebrate the Reformation, we must be reminded that the work is not finished. The cry of the Reformers was not reformed once and done. Rather, the Reformers said, reformed and always reforming according to the Word of God. Because challenges arise. New threats appear. And so we who are faithful must always be reforming, not according to the whims of culture, not according to our personal preferences. We must always be reforming according to the word of God. We always have to come back to the center. We always have to be wary lest we drift away from the truth. Or as Jude puts it, we must always be contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This isn't a constantly adapting church that ever changes the message to suit the culture in which it finds itself. We're not free to look at the scripture and say, well, that was just a cultural thing. That's not for today. This isn't a call to, to acquiesce to the pressures of society. This is a call for the church to recognize the once-for-all-time nature of the gospel, a never-changing, never-conforming message, and then we are called to contend for it. To contend is an athletic idea that denotes striving or, or exerting energy. It's not a passive phrase. It's not something that is done for you. You must actively contend for the faith. Neither is this a defensive notion. This is active. It's energetic. It, it's, it's standing at home plate and swinging away. It's taking that jump shot. It's throwing the Hail Mary. To contend means we can't hide away and live as hermits. As tempting as that might be in this culture today, we're not called to, to build a hole and live out the rest of our days in that hole. We can't retreat from the culture. We can't be undercover or camouflage Christians at work or at school. We have to actively contend for the faith. And as we'll see in Jude's letter, this is more than just a verbal activity. It's not just attacking false teaching, though that is part of contending for the faith, but in the book of Jude, to contend means much more to live a bold, countercultural, authentic Christian life. It's not simply verbal and then doing something else. It's living a godly life that is centered on the person and work of Christ Jesus, no matter what happens in the culture. No matter what society says, no matter the pressures that are put upon you or the threats that are made against you. And that may be scary to some of you. That may make you a little nervous because the culture is putting pressure upon us, it is telling us to change. If Western civilization had its way, Christianity could just disappear. And so when we 
live bold, authentic Christian lives, when we contend for the faith, there's going to be pushback. And that's not very pleasant. Jude himself tells us up front, this is not the letter I had originally intended to write to you. I had been very eager, he writes in verse 3, to, to write to you about our common salvation. I, I wanted to write about things that we all have in common and just celebrate and, and revel in these truths. But then he says, I found it necessary. How much more necessary it is for us living in 21st century America. Not only do we, like Martin Luther, still face an apostate Roman Catholic Church, but we face atheism and an increasingly hostile state. We face the threats of Islam. We, we face the threats of a whole plethora of false religions. Even amongst Christians, we face the word of faith heresy. It's creeping in, even into Southern Baptist churches. And we're facing a cultural Christianity that craves acceptance. It craves political power. It craves prestige and respectability and worldly pleasure and peace without a cross. We cannot simply sit back and celebrate the Reformation. We must keep on reforming. We must contend for the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints. And so let's look at our book. Let's walk through the book and let's, let's explore what Jude is, is teaching to us. What he's speaking to us, his thesis is right there in verse 3. I found it necessary to write appealing to you, pleading with you exhorting and urging you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Because in verses 4 through 19, he tells us there is a false gospel that destroys. There is a false gospel that destroys. Look at verse 4. He urges us, he, he appeals to us to contend for the faith. For... Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Why do we have to contend for the faith? Because false teachers have crept in. They've crept in unnoticed. This isn't an outside threat. Th throughout this book, this is not an outside threat. He's not warning against those people outside these four walls. This is inside. We worry so much about what's going on outside, don't we? Who will be the next president? What law they're going to pass? What, what the culture is going to say next? We, we worry so much about what's going on outside. Peruse the New Testament. Just a surface level reading of, of Paul's letters or the, the general epistles or, or the book of Revelation. The major threat is consistently inside the church. The threat that's being warned against is not so much what's going on outside, but what's going on inside. Let the nations rage against the church. Uh, let them beat us and abuse us. Let them arrest us. Let them kill us. But may we always and forever maintain the purity, both spiritually and morally, of the bride. So we see in verse 4 that there's both a spiritual threat, a doctrinal threat, and a moral threat. Certain people have crept in unnoticed, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. They, they view this idea that we are saved by grace alone apart from our works and they say, giddy up. We can live however we want to live. 
It doesn't matter because we're saved by grace. It doesn't matter what we do. And so they pervert the grace of God into sensuality and living this worldly life. But not only is it moral error, it's also doctrinal error. They deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Inside threat, both moral and doctrinal. It's the same today. Now, if Jude were at a typical Southern Baptist church, he'd probably have to dust off the old resume and start looking for a new place. Because look at what he says about these false teachers. They're ungodly people. If you read through the book, he calls them ungodly five times. They're ungodly. Look at verse 15. They're ungodly in all of their deeds of ungodliness. They commit them in ungodly ways. They're ungodly sinners. Verse 16, he calls them grumblers and malcontents. They follow their own sinful desires. They're loudmouth boasters. They show favoritism to gain advantage. Look at verse 19. He, he says they cause divisions. They're worldly people. They're devoid of the Spirit. These are people inside the church. I was just thinking about it last night as I was, I was meditating upon it. He's talking about real people. The, the church that he writes to, they open it up and they read this, and the people he's talking about are sitting in the pews. And if he was in a Southern Baptist church, oh man, Jude, you can't say those things. You can't say these people are loudmouth. You can't say they're worldly. You can't say they're devoid of the Spirit. That's not very nice. Take the recent uproar over John MacArthur. If you've been on social media at all, you're either reading about Kanye West becoming a Christian or you're reading about John MacArthur saying, go home to Beth Moore. Those are the only two options. At a recent conference, when asked about Beth Moore, who is a prominent Southern Baptist who preaches to men, but that isn't even the, the, the most serious charge against her. She believes in continuing revelation. She is unwilling to give any kind of position on homosexuality, even when asked and so when asked about her, John MacArthur said she ought to go home. And for that, he's been called rude, uncourteous, misogynistic. Never mind it being true. All the while, Southern Baptist leaders have been condemning John MacArthur for his views on Beth Moore, while two prominent Southern Baptist pastors in Dallas have endorsed false teacher Paula White's new book. We live in strange, strange times. Strange times when John MacArthur is the one in the wrong against people who flaunt their rebellion against God's word, even if they are SBC darlings. Because it's not nice. We can't say those things. We gotta be unified. It all falls under the umbrella of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Thankfully, Jude and the other apostles were less concerned about being nice than some of the current SBC leadership is when it comes to the truth being assaulted. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul, writing to the churches in Galatia, he says, I am astonished, I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. 
And you may say, well, I mean, these prominent SBC pastors, they, they know Paula White better than we do. I just watched a clip of her this past week where she's denying that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. No, no, he's, he's the first fruits. We're all sons of God. When we understand the seriousness of false teaching, that this isn't some game, it's not politics, when we realize that there are eternal destinies of real men and women at stake, then we'll stop caring more about niceness than we care about the truth. To highlight the seriousness of these false teachings, Jude gives seven examples. Seven examples here, beginning in verse 5 and going through verse 13, to highlight how serious the false teaching is in the church. This is not something that we just say, oh, those, those people are just a little weird, but, you know, you'll warm up to them. It's okay. He says, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, see the, the slow shift, they're drifting, so he has to pull them back. I have to remind you by pulling you back to the center that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Remember the Israelites? Remember when they came out of Egypt? Who granted them salvation. It was Jesus. Not the nice Jesus, gentle Jesus. Won't we'll ever say that you're wrong, Jesus. That's often peddled in modern evangelical churches. This is the Jesus who saved Israel through 10 plagues upon Egypt and brought Israel out with a powerful hand, and when they rebelled against him, he laid waste to them in the wilderness. This is the holy Jesus of both the New and the Old Testament. They were saved by Jesus, but they died in the wilderness, many of them because of their grumbling. Not only that, but verse 6 talks about the angels. The angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Imagine these angels who have been created to serve and worship God in glory. Uh, they don't have the same restrictions as we do. They see the spiritual realm. And here they rebel against God because of their pride. Ought we not to take great pains against our own pride? If the angels in glory lost their place, then what does that say about you? Beware of your pride. Beware of the pride of these false teachers who want to elevate man so that Jesus isn't the only begotten. You're all sons and daughters of God. Beware of such false, blasphemous teaching. He goes on in verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Here, he's aiming at the, the moral false teachings, the sexual immorality, the, this perversion of God's grace that says, well, since God saved us by grace, we can live however we want. That's not what the scriptures teach. Those who have been genuinely saved by God's grace are new creation. They are new creatures. They have a changed heart, they have changed desires, they have changed affections, and they won't indulge in sexual immorality. The word that the ESV translates here in verse 7 as unnatural desire, it's strange flesh. It's homosexuality. Don't let anybody ever say, oh, the Bible just whispers about homosexuality. 
That's what J.D. Greer, the president of the SBC, said in a sermon. The Bible doesn't whisper about homosexuality. It screams out a warning. Don't indulge in these things. He goes on. He says in verse 8 that, that these people are just like this. In like manner, these people are relying on their dreams. They're defiling the flesh. They reject authority. They blaspheme the glorious ones. This is what false teaching does. It doesn't make you more righteous. It doesn't cause you to pursue Christ. It causes you to pursue yourself causes you to pursue your own desires. He says that these false teachers are, are worse than Michael. The archangel Michael, he's contending with the devil. He's disputing about the body of Moses. This is, this is an interesting a story here, it's from a, a, an extra biblical story, but the lesson is, look at what Michael did. When he was disputing with the devil, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but instead he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people, they blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. They go around just binding and rebuking all of these false teachers, all, all these demons, all these, these unclean spirits. You know who that sounds like? It sounds like the word of faith teachers. Going around binding the demon of nicotine that was a joke there's no demon of nicotine they're like Cain verse 11 they walked in the way of Cain what did Cain do he had no regard for God and he had no love for his brother and so he murdered him he had no faith and so he offered a, a, an offering that God was not pleased with. And when God rebuked him, rather than repenting, he murdered his brother. That's what these false teachers are like. They are proud. They are boastful. They love themselves. They don't love God. They don't love the brethren. They're like Balaam. They, 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 they abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. If you look back at, at Numbers, you'll see the story of Balaam. This prophet who was hired to curse Israel. And God told him, you only go and bless them. But for the sake of money, he went in order to curse Israel. This is what these false teachers are like. They have a love of money that... that consumes them and they abandon all reasoning they abandon all faithfulness for the sake of a buck and they perished in Korah's rebellion Korah was the ringleader of a rebellion against Moses in the book of Numbers rather than submit to the leadership that God had put in place he rebels and he raises up a rebellion against Moses and he and all of his family, they perish. This is what the false teachers are like. They grumble, they complain, they rebel. They're filled with pride and boastfulness and, and they pursue sexual immorality. They, they consider themselves as having more power than the angels. They have no love for the brethren. They have only love for themselves and for money. They rebel against any established leadership. This is what the false teachers look like. This is serious. This is not something that can be swept under the rug. They're teaching a false gospel. A gospel that's not centered on Christ, it's centered on sensuality. It's a gospel that doesn't result in holiness. It's a gospel that results in licentiousness. 
It's a gospel that will destroy them. Jesus, speaking in Matthew chapter 7, says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Don't join them in their folly. Uh Oh, but Joel Osteen, he seems so nice. He never says a mean word about anybody. No, he doesn't. Oh, my Mormon neighbors, they seem so nice. They've got good families. They, they, they look like they're, they're righteous. There is a false gospel that destroys. God is holy. You have rebelled. You are a sinner. You deserve the justice of God. But God sent his only begotten son to die a substitutionary death, to take all the wrath and justice of God upon himself on the cross. He died for sinners. And three days later, he was raised so that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Any other gospel, and anyone who brings a different gospel, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. And that's exactly what will happen. Judgment is coming upon these false teachers and their false message, and on everyone who follows them in their folly. Verse 14. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is the ultimate state of every false gospel. This is the final judgment of everyone who trusts in a different gospel than the one laid out in the Old and New Testament. If you are trusting that, I'm good enough. I I know that I make some mistakes, but I, I, I try to do better. And I think that at the end of the day, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. If you're trusting in some message that says that, oh, Jesus died so that everyone goes to heaven. Love wins. One day, every single person, regardless of what they they believed or how they lived, they'll eventually make it. Or if you're believing a message that says, well, you know, God doesn't really care how you come to him. So one person comes from this direction, another person comes from this direction, but they all wind up in the same place. If you're believing any of these false messages, you're believing a false gospel that will damn you to hell for eternity. There is only one true gospel. There is only one way to God, and it is through God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one way that you can be saved, and it's through the blood of Christ on the cross. Judgment is coming. There is a false gospel that destroys. Now is as good a place as any to pause and ask if you are trusting in Christ. Are you trusting in this gospel? Are you being honest with yourself about your sin? Have you taken a good long look at the holiness of God? Are you comparing your good deeds with someone else? Compare your righteousness with the perfect holiness of God. All have sinned. All have fallen short of God's glory. 
And if you're trusting in your own good deeds, then those good deeds will lead you to hell. Repent of your sins. Turn away from even your supposed self-righteousness. Turn away even from your religious practices that you think are going to gain you favor with God. Trust Christ alone. And you don't have to wait until the end of the sermon to repent and trust in Christ. Repent and trust him now. Come to Christ. Fall on your knees. Find him to be a gracious and loving Savior. Are you contending for this faith? Saints, are you contending for this faith? Are you contending for this faith? Or are you watering down the message so that you don't get as much pushback? Are, are you watering it down just a little bit so that it sounds a little nicer? Contend for the faith. Contend for this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Not your own variation of it. This gospel. This faith. Contend for it. Because it's only this faith, it's only this gospel that has the power to save sinners. Don't think that you can make it better. Don't think that you have the authority to change it. Don't think that you are wiser or more loving than God. But you, contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Look at verses 20 through 22. These false teachers, they, they cause divisions. They're, they're worldly. They're devo devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Notice the, the contrast between verses 19 and 20. It's these who are doing these worldly things, but you do these things. Jude, in verse 3, he tells us that we're to contend for the faith, but up to this point, we may be scratching our head and saying, how do we contend? It's all well and good to say, all right, contend for the faith, but how do we do it? Certainly verbally, accurately communicating the gospel to others, but it's more than that. And so he lays it out in verses 20 and 21 exactly how we are to contend for the faith. He says, build yourself up in the most holy faith. Build yourself up. Strengthen yourself in the faith. And you may say, well, how do I do that? Well, by sleeping in on Sunday. And if you do come, make sure to wipe the dust off your Bible first so no one sees it. And then, you know, when you come... Find a, a comfy pew so you can take a nap or stare at your phone because the game's about to start. No, that's not how we can, that's not how we build ourselves in the most holy faith. You build yourself up by making use of the means of grace that God has given to you. His word. Be in his word. A, a baby needs milk. A Christian needs the word of God. Build yourself up in your most holy faith by being in the scriptures, reading it, digging into it, digesting it. But not only do you need the word, you need the church. You need the church. That's kind of fallen out of fashion nowadays. People thinking that they can be just as good a Christian outside the church as in the church. You were not saved to be a lone, isolated Christian. You were saved together. We're so individualistic that we forget that Christ, he, he's purchased a bride that is consisting of all of you. And I know that I'm talking to people who are here in the church, but be here consistently. Look around and see the people who aren't here. Where are they? What are we doing about it? We must be finding those who are straying so that they too might be built up in the most holy faith. Pray. He goes on to say, praying in the Holy Spirit. 
Now, it's easy for us to say pray. We need to pray, but he adds on that preposition that we're supposed to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I don't think he's just using up words. I think that he means pray in the Holy Spirit. Jesus already taught in Matthew chapter 6 that we're, when we pray, we're not supposed to pray like the Gentiles who blather on and on repeating mindless words. We're not meant to be like Perry Stone. I, I saw this video of Perry Stone a couple of weeks ago, this word of faith heretic who is speaking in tongues, praying for people's healing while he's looking at his phone. And he even loses his train of thought. He starts to trail off because he's reading what's on his phone. This is not the kind of praying that Jude has in mind. We're to pray in the Holy Spirit. John Bunyan said, when you pray, better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Keep yourself in the love of God. How are we supposed to do that? Keep yourself in the love of God. Well, look over at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I think that Jude is echoing what Jesus has already said to his disciples in John chapter 15. Keep yourselves in the love of God. We do that by doing what Jesus teaches here in John chapter 15. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. All well and good. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Abide in the love of God. Abide in Christ. But how do we do that? Jesus says in verses 9 and 10, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do you abide? You keep Jesus' commandments. How do you keep yourselves in the love of God? By keeping his commandments. We're not saved to lawlessness. We are saved to good deeds. We are saved not so that we can throw this book aside and say, I can do it on my own. We are to be in this word and we are to obey what it says. And we keep ourselves in the love of God. And then he says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Contrary to verses 14 through 18, where the ungodly will experience judgment at the second coming, we wait for the second coming and the resurrection of our bodies. I think that in our day and age, especially in the West, that our thoughts about the second coming tend towards the bizarre. Walk into a Christian bookstore and you'll find all manner of bizarre books teaching on what they think is the second coming. And I think that so many people are focusing on these bizarre things. I've seen more Christian books focusing on the Antichrist and his coming, and when he's going to come, and what he's going to do, and, and all of these things surrounding the Antichrist, then you see talking about Christ. We're not to be looking for the glorious appearance of the Antichrist. We're to be looking forward to the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this ought to affect how we live. If we're always living in light of the fact that Christ will come, 
If we're always living in, fa- in light of the fact that Christ, when he comes, will glorify our bodies, that will transform how we view everything. It will transform how we live. John he says that everyone who waits for this this hope he purifies himself if you're waiting for the glorious appearance of Christ then you'll purify your lives you'll pursue godliness you'll contend for the faith this is how we contend for the faith we we stay in the word we get plugged in and we, we're, we're faithful and consistent in the church. We, we devote ourselves to praying in the Holy Spirit. We're faithful to keep His commands. Always waiting for the mercy of Christ that leads to eternal life. Always with our, our eyes set not on the things of this world, but on the things that are coming. Not not being tied down to this world, but looking for the new world. This is how we contend for the faith. And it's not something that's passive. We have to actively be doing it. You're not going to wake up and your Bible is not going to fly up and hit you in the face. you got to pick up your Bible and open it and read it. You're not here by accident. You set your alarm. You got dressed. You drove here. You're here actively. And when you're here, you need to be active. This is a time of worship. You're not passively listening. You're actively listening. So that when you leave here, you don't passively obey. You actively set out to obey all the commands of Scripture. Waiting for the return of Christ is not passive. You are actively, actively looking forward to it. This is how we contend for the faith. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We make use of the warning passages, like those laid out in Hebrews. We listen to them, we obey them so that we don't drift away. We examine ourselves in light of Scripture. This means that you can't be lazy, you you can't rest secure in your own righteousness you have a sin nature you who are redeemed you still have the old man striving against you and he's always looking for a a way in he's always looking for that that chink in the armor you live in a fallen world you're surrounded by temptations you have an enemy that prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour you can't be lazy the world the flesh the devil they are very real threats we have to examine ourselves in light of the scripture and contend for the faith am i puffed up and conceited do i like to stir up and cause division am i worldly Do I care more about what's on TV than what's in the Word of God? Am I worldly? Am I perverting God's grace and making it a license for sin? Examine yourself to see if you're contending for the faith. What about others? How can I help others contend for the faith? Well, that's what he says in verses 22 and 23. How do I help others contend for the faith? Well, first, you have to be in the Word yourself. You have to be honest about your own sin and your own weaknesses before you turn to somebody else and say, hey, let me get that speck out of your eye. All the while, your plank is just flying around. You have to be honest about your own sin. Second, you have to be here. You have to be here. You, you have to be involved in other people's lives or else how would you even know how to help other people contend for the faith? You can't be someone that just shows up randomly in church and says, hey, I noticed that you've, uh, 
You're sinning. Who are you? Are you a member here? We have to be here. We have to be involved in each other's lives. We have to love and know each other. But then Jude gives instructions, especially geared towards those who have bought into false teaching. He says, have mercy on those who doubt. Have mercy on those who doubt. Those who are struggling. Those who are hearing some of these things that are are being broadcast on on TBN or or things that they're hearing from from people like Paula White. What what does this mean? And, And how does this square with the scriptures? Have mercy on them. Not jumping on them, not being critical and saying, how dare you even give them a time of day? Being merciful to them. Not full of cynicism. Not making faces. (laughs) I really have a hard time with this. Julia knows. Have mercy on those who doubt. Being patient. Snatching some out of the fire. There's some urgency here. Not watching them burn. I told you not to listen to them. Go and get them and grab them and bring them out. And you may not be very nice about it. If my neighbor's house is on fire and he's still in there, I'm I'm not going to, come on. Come on, it's, it's okay out here. I'm going to run in and bodily grab him and bring him out because his house is on fire. Sometimes we have to do that with those who are following false teaching. We've got to grab them and snatch them out of the fire. But with some, we have to show mercy with fear. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. This is maybe directed at the false teachers themselves those who are actually teaching it or those who have bought into it fully. We're still to have mercy on them. For to be fearful. We're to hate the garment stained by the flesh. He's alluding to these Old Testament purity laws where if you you touch someone who's unclean, you become unclean too. Be careful around false teachers lest they start to rub off on you. Have mercy on them. Share the gospel with them, but don't get too close. Contend. This is active. It's not passive. And notice it has to do with lifestyle as much as it has to do with theology. We contend for the faith because there's a false gospel that destroys. We contend for the faith by by actively pursuing these godly habits. But then what do we do? Having done all of this, what do we do? We hope in the Christ of the gospel. We hope in the Christ of the gospel. That's what verses 24 and 25 are all about. Having done all to stand firm, stand. And Jude ends in a doxology. Because he knows that the ultimate outcome of everything that he's written about relies and rests in the hands of an almighty, sovereign, caring, and gracious God. And so he's told them to contend for the faith. He's told them how to contend for the faith. And now he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Having been reminded of the dangers of the false teaching, being reminded of how to contend for the faith, now he says, hope in Christ. You might look at verse 1. He says, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ Jesus. In verse 1, you are kept. In verse 21, he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. You must actively 
keep yourselves. And then verse 24 comes the great promise. He is able to keep you. He is able. He will keep you. Despite all the dangers, toils, and snares, we can have hope. Hope for ourselves. Hope for this church. Hope that the gospel of Jesus will be victorious and Christ shall have the bride for which he died. Isaiah 53 says he will see and be satisfied. How can we be sure? Because Christ is able to accomplish all of his purposes and he will do it. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, from from falling into false teaching. And he will present you blameless before the presence of his glory. We will see him face to face. Two reasons why he will do this. One is for our joy. He is able to present us blameless before his presence with great joy. All that he's saying about contending, it's not meant to be a a party pooper. He's not trying to make your life miserable. He wants your everlasting, eternal joy. The problem is we're always pursuing lesser things. We're always pursuing things that we think will make us happy be it money or entertainment or sex or notoriety. We're always pursuing these things. We think that that in these things we'll be happy, but what we, we forfeit is true joy. Christ wants us to have true joy. And so in his graciousness, he will keep us from stumbling and will present us before his glorious presence with great joy. But we must contend. We have to fight for this joy. We have to pursue this joy. We have to actively be going after this eternal joy. The second reason why why he will do this is for his own glory. He rejoices in his own glory. It's for your joy, but it's also for God's joy. He loves his glory and he wants to share his, his glory with his people. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Won't you contend for this faith? We have to believe this gospel. We have to fight for this gospel. We have to pursue actively this gospel, contending for it. And then having done everything to contend for it, we rest in the hope of God. We rest in our loving Christ who is able and he is willing and he will keep us to the end. But we have to fight for it. And it's going to cost blood, sweat, and tears. This is not for the lazy. It's not for the complacent. It's not for those who want to drift into heaven. No one drifts into heaven. People only drift into apostasy. You have to fight for this gospel. I think there's a reason why in Revelation 21, 8, John says that the cowards are outside the New Jerusalem. This gospel is not for cowards. It's for fighters. It's for warriors. It's for those who would rather face the yawning maw of bloodthirsty lions than lose out on the glory and the hope of eternal life in Christ. Martin Luther, he nailed the 95 Thesis to the castle door in Wittenberg, and it caused controversy. The Pope, not a big fan. And so in 1521, Martin Luther was summoned to the Diet of Worms. 
where he was told to recant. He asked for some time to consider it, and he came back, and they told him again, recant. Recant of everything that you've been writing. Recant of this, this message that people are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And these are his now famous words that you're probably familiar with, but it, it does us good to hear them again. Unless I am convinced of error by the testimony of Scripture or by manifest reasoning, I stand convinced by the Scriptures to which I have appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's Word. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to act against conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. God help us all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for loving us, sending your son Jesus to die for us, so that we who believe will not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, I pray that your saints will be built up in this gospel, and I pray that they will be emboldened to live out this gospel and to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to them. And I pray that despite the pressures of culture, despite even the pressures of our own denomination, that we, as this church, will never water down and will never back down from preaching the pure gospel of Christ. And I pray, God, that as we leave here, that we will be courageous to contend for the faith in this dark world. I pray that we will shine the light of Christ, that we will proclaim the gospel, and I pray that in your mercy and your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we will see lost men and women and boys and girls come to faith in Christ. And so, God, we pray that you'll give us strength. And we rest and hope in you. We thank you again for Jesus. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his life. And we pray with the saints of 2,000 years. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.